Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk Nation Radio, why hasn't Trump been prosecuted in court yet? Our guest, Paul Jay, is a journalist and filmmaker. He's the founder and publisher of TheAnalysis.News website. He is past chair of the Documentary Organization of Canada and was the founding chair of the Hot Docs Canadian International Documentary Festival. Paul Jay was the co-executive producer of Face Off and Counterspin, nightly primetime debate programs that ran for 10 years on CBC News World. Jay was the founder of The Real News Network. Paul Jay is currently working on a documentary series with Daniel Ellsberg based on his terrific book, Doomsday Machine. Paul Jay, welcome to Talk Nation Radio. Thanks very much, David. Uh, very glad to finally have you on here. Uh, you had me on your pro various programs many, many times, for which I was grateful. Um, and, and this is some terrific articles you've written at theanalysis.news. Uh, what is your view? Should Donald Trump be prosecuted in court? And if so, how and for what? <laughs> uh, well, there's so many things. Where do you begin? Uh, the angle I'm taking, uh, because other people have picked up other reasons he should be prosecuted, um, is that I think he attempted, I think there's evidence that he attempted a coup by meaning uh, he tried to get the acting Secretary of Defense to intervene with the military uh, before the inauguration of Biden uh, and actually declare, do what Michael Flynn publicly called for in mid-December, declare martial law and call a new election. Um, I, I think it was delusional, uh, but it, I, it seems to be a real scheme. And the reason I'm saying so is because it was publicly attacked, announced, in the Washington Post, first of all, by 10 former secretaries of defense, wrote a letter calling on the military not to intervene. And then uh, Admiral uh, Zadridis, Zabridis, I, I always screw up his name, I'm sorry, but he was the former Supreme Commander of NATO. He wrote a, a, an article on January 4th, which is the same day the 10 secretaries letter hit the Post, supporting the 10 secretaries. And this former NATO commander also talks about the possibilities of the acting Secretary of Defense. Uh, he had the words he uses, not having the temperament to stand up to a willful president. And specifically says that this was all done in response to uh, retired General Michael F Flynn. It was Michael Flynn, right? Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, so, so this seems to have been a real scheme to try to involve the military. Uh, and, uh, and it's not just me that thinks this. Uh, the Financial Times on the, I think it was also on the 4th, all of this seems to hit on January 4th. The Financial Times has an editorial where they say, as, as, as bizarre as this is, seems, there is a coup in progress. And so it's not just me coming to this conclusion, it's the editorial board of the Financial Times. So organizing a coup, attempting to organize a coup associated with violence, and the violence obviously is the uh, riot on January 6th, which I'm calling the final act of a failed coup. The Democrats, the media, the press, everyone's focused just on that one day but they're taking the day out of the context that the day was the tr supposed to be, it seems, the trigger for a military intervention. Now, I think Trump was out of his mind, and I I'm actually even surprised that these leading figures, secretaries of defense, and also they, there was a, a couple of tweets from the uh, Ch Milley, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, also telling the military to stay out of this. So th this actually came a little closer than, than I think maybe we thought it was. And, and the thing that twigged that for me is the next week in Time Magazine, and I have in this report I have up on my site now that Google tried to censor, we can get into that. But yeah, yeah. the same admiral had another article and he was talking about the growth of this far right extremism in the military and how it has to be purged and cleansed from the military, and he had a very interesting statistic. 
that uh, active duty and retired military make up 7% of the American population, but 14% of the people being targeted by the FBI for having been involved in the January 6 events on the Hill. The, uh, there's a lot more going on here than, than, than is being reported on, and I'm kind of shocked that I seem to be the only one on to this story, which, which either makes me mad or I don't know what it makes everybody else. I had seen over 20% active or former military on January 6th at Capitol Hill. Was that, was that wrong? I, I don't know. I was just quoting the Admiral. I have no idea. But I don't think this no, is I just know. about who was on the Hill. The investigation goes further afield. Uh, but your number might be right. I, I'm just quoting the Admiral. And, of course, mass shooters are over 35% uh, veterans of the U.S. military, trained uh, most of them in how to shoot people. Uh, but you can't mention that uh, in you know, respectable media. Um, Paul J., what about uh, Mitch McConnell's role? You've uh, focused on him a little as well, right? Yeah, uh, let me just make one more point about Trump. Sure. Um, I do think it's a mistake to focus on Trump as if he's some individual aberration. Uh, while he should be charged, and the reason I'm pushing that, honestly, because it opens up a lot of shit that should help reveal some of the uh, kind of what's really going on in terms of the rise of a fascist movement. Uh, I've been calling Trump the, the buffoon tip of a serious fascist spear. I think Trump was a very good vehicle for some very serious right, far right wing forces that start off in the billionaire class, in the elites. And then they arouse sections of the working class, the military, uh, and then the, another very big component of this, which I also think is part of this manipulation by these far-right elites, and that's the uh, right-wing evangelical and Christian movements that are also extremely strong in the military. I've done a few stories on this, and I have it, uh, an interview I did with former Ambassador Joe Wilson, who died you know, just a couple of months after I interviewed him. And one of the segments we did was about the strength so, really significant strength of this far right religious movement, and not just amongst the rank and file, but at the highest levels. And I think when these guys, uh, like the 10 former secretaries of defense and the admiral, they're writing, I think they're writing because there's such a serious uh, component of the far right religio religious at the officer level that actually might have done something. So, uh, so. So anyway, we can get more into that if you want. As far as McConnell goes, I'm sorry, do you want to ask something about that first? or? Well, I'm, I'm just curious why you think Congress doesn't take this seriously and focuses, as you say, so much on what happened on Capitol Hill on the 6th, that other than the fact that it was at Congress and they only care about themselves. Uh, I mean, why? I, I, I mean, I've heard people dismiss the very idea of the word coup in reference to any of this. But if you look at things that we routinely call coup, like efforts to install Juan Guaido in Venezuela with Trump involved, uh, they don't look any more in uh, any more or less incompetent. Uh, well, it's not as if the failure of a coup or the incompetence or the buffoonishness of the participants makes it less of a coup. If it did, you know, the Bay of Pigs wouldn't be a coup attempt either, right? Yeah, right. Uh, I think. If you look at the events of January 6th in isolation, then it, I wouldn't have called that a coup either. And, and actually, my first response on January 6th was, you know, even calling this an insurrection, it seems kind of exaggerated. You know, it's a riot. It's a, they, they storm the buildings. You don't take over a government because you occupy some buildings. You know, you could occupy the White House. You don't take over the government as long as the state is still operating. But when you look at it in the context of what happened with these, uh, what seems to be an attempt to involve the military as called out by the 10 former secretaries, the Admiral, Financial Times, and so on, then it's the last act of a failed coup. And then in that context, it's, it's very significant what happened on the 6th. Now, why isn't Congress taking this up? Well, I think there's probably several reasons, but I think one of the most significant things that happened on the 6th is that the doors of Congress get stormed around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At 3.34, I can be precise because it was on their website, the Association of American Manufacturers 
issue a statement denouncing the violence and calling on Vice President Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. Now, that's 90 minutes after the doors get breached. How are they so ready to take such an action? Now, this is an organization that has been so pro-Trump for four years. And this is kind of the real point of my article, which is the, uh, the banking class, the uh, billionaire class, Wall Street, they got everything they wanted out of this Trump administration, you know, all the tax cuts, all the deregulation. But then when he wouldn't transfer power peacefully, that threatened this, uh, you know, investors nirvana and the, the, the instability and chaos that would have come from all that. Now they, they, they had enough of Trump and they want him gone, which is why McConnell takes the position he takes, because he's told by these elites enough is enough. Because McConnell has been enabling Trump up until just a few days before the 6th. You know, Trump has a right to have his court cases, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but a few days that, you know, before that, they say, the elites say, and it's clear from the statement of the Association of American Manufacturers, which is like the almost the biggest corporate lobbyist on the Hill, except for maybe the Chamber of Com Commerce. They say to them, you better certify the Biden. And, any, and, any, and we know later Wall Street said they're not even going to finance campaigns of, of anyone that didn't vote to certify. So McConnell stands up and says he's going to certify. Even Lindsey Graham says he said, and Pence says he's going to do what he's supposed to do. Now, of course, Trump goes nuts. The crowd goes nuts. They're going to go and hang Pence with a noose. But the American Association of Manufacturers, within 90 minutes, has such a statement out and that's a dramatic thing to call for the 25th Amendment. You can't just say, oh, let's, let's do this 90 minutes later, have your statement. So what, what, did I th what I think McConnell did? Well, let me start with what I know as facts. The Capitol Hill Police report to a body which is made up of the Sergeant of Arms of the House, the Sergeant of Arms of the Senate, and a third person who's appointed, I, I think, by the president. And for some reason, it's the architect. I mean, it, I, the, the third guy's meaningless. The two guys that matter are the sergeant of arms. But in the pecking order of the infrastructure of Capitol Hill, it's the Senate that's senior. Like, for example, if you go get press credentials, which I have, you go to the Senate TV and radio gallery to get your press credentials. But that gives you the credentials for the entire Congress. Well, the same thing is true for Capitol Hill police. And I confirmed this with the radio and TV uh, gallery. The pecking order is the chief of police reports to the two sergeant of arms, but mostly to the Senate. And who does the Senate sergeant of arms report to? The Senate. Well, what does that mean? The majority of the Senate. And what does that mean? the majority leader. And I've confirmed this with the, the radio and television gallery people. So the Senate of Arms of the Senate reports to McConnell. Now, there is no way that they have all this intelligence that these uh, right-wing crazies are coming, white supremacists and so on. They know that it's going to be violent. They know they're going to storm the buildings. There's the, the acting chief of police who took over after the first guy had to resign after the 6th. She testifies to the House Appropriations Committee on January 26th, I think it is, that we knew everything that was going to happen, we knew ahead of time. Well, how is it possible that the chief, the Senate Sergeant of Arms doesn't go tell McConnell? So I think what happens is McConnell tells them not to do much of anything. This Yolan Ganda Pittman acting chief of police, says to the Senate Appropriations Committee, we, the, our former chief asked the sergeant of arms to get the National Guard in on, on January 5th, asked them to come on the 6th and help man the perimeter. And we were told no. Says sergeant of arms tells them no. Is it possible that he does that without McConnell? And, and, and another reason why I think that's not possible Washington Post reports that on January 6th, at around 3 in the afternoon, they, this is based on an interview the Post does with the f former chief of police. He asks again for the National Guard to be called in. He goes to the Senate Sergeant of Arms. He says, will you bring the Guard in now? 
And quote, this is in the Washington Post, it's in my article, he says, I'll have to ask my boss McConnell. And the chief of police tells the Washington Post, I never heard from them again. Okay, now I'm into speculation. I think McConnell did it to, to screw up Trump. They said, okay, let them come storm the place. Trump's going to wear it. And finally, we're going to so discredit Trump, we'll, we'll weaken his hold on the Republican Party. And what I call, I call, I call this a failed coup within a failed coup. Trump's coup failed and so did McConnell because he didn't break the grip of Trump on the party. Yeah, I mean, this is speculating, and, and this wouldn't prove anything, but I wonder, do we know where physically McConnell was as these people were smashing into the Capitol? Was he the first one to, to get out uh, to safety? Was he, you know, did he, are you speculating that he did this thinking he was endangering his own safety or just those of his colleagues? I would say those of his colleagues. I think the leadership got out pretty quickly. Yeah. Now, the other reason you asked me why isn't Congress making more out of this? We'll see. Uh, there is an issue of what did Nancy Pelosi know and when did she know it and what did she do about it? Did the sergeant of arms of the House fail to tell Pelosi that they weren't calling in the guard, even though the chief of police had asked them to? It's possible. Um, there, has, there have been some reports that Pelosi and some people that work with Pelosi have claimed they were lied to by the sergeant of arms of the House that they were told that there was enough security. And it's possible that that's true. Uh, I, I, I still think they're not, they don't want, you know, they're wary of where an investigation will lead of McConnell. And, and I have some evidence for that, which is when Raskin was gonna call witnesses for the, at the uh, impeachment, he says we're calling witnesses and then Cruz, Senator Cruz says, well, if you call witnesses, we're going to call witnesses, and our first witness is going to be Nancy Pelosi, and we're going to ask her what did she know and what did she, when did she know what she's going to do about it. Cruz says this, and then Raskin sure. says, okay, we're not calling any witnesses. Well, I would never underestimate incompetence either by McConnell or Pelosi, certainly Pelosi, or, uh, or by the Capitol Police. I mean, as someone who's been arrested by the Capitol Police numerous times for speaking up in committee hearings where I was not a, a witness, uh, I can certainly confirm that they answer to the chairman of the committee, uh, but also that they don't know what in the world they're doing. They've got, you know... 20 year old computers and don't know how to type and use one finger and can't spell. And uh, I, I mean, the, it's just the level of incompetence, the inability even to effectively arrest somebody, uh, you know, I, but, I, but, I, I but they want to but, underestimate malevolence, but, but I never want to underestimate incompetence well, either. They certainly don't rule each other out, but unless she's outright lying, she told the House Appropriations Committee that they asked the Sergeant of Arms of the National Guard on January 5th and were turned down. So that's, that's not incompetence. And you gotta ask, right. why the hell are they turned down? Now, the only argument being given is that they didn't want the optics of the military standing there with protesters on the other side. Now, of course, they've never minded that when it's the left or, or Black Lives Matter or whatever. But anyway, let's say they were really worried about the optics. Then what you do, and this gets done all the time, is you get your National Guard or your extra police and you put them in the tunnels of Congress because there's miles of tunnels and you keep them there. And when you need them, you bring them out. You don't have to have the optics unless, unless you really do need them. And, and it's not an unusual thing to do. And they don't even do that. Well, if they don't worry about any optics when it's a bunch of peace demonstrators, with, you know, holding yeah. up posters instead of, you know, bats and sticks. I, I, I mean, it, they don't I, I, I don't find that credible at all. But I don't so, either. Uh, what, what do you think might uh, bring out some useful information? Do you think a, a government commission being set up along the lines of a 9-11 commission or the NAACP taking Trump to court or any of these? Is there any prospect of more information coming out or anyone being held accountable for anything? Well, they, they, they're talking about this 9-11 commission. Mind you, the 9-11 commission was pretty terrible. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe the process is okay, but 
the conclusions they came to were terrible. I'm, I, I'm more with Bob Graham's investigation, Senator Bob Graham of the Joint Congressional Committee, whose conclusion was that the Saudi government was involved and that Cheney and Bush knew something was coming and didn't stop it. I mean, that's, that's the actual conclusions of this Joint Congressional Committee. And uh, sure. nobody, nobody talks about that either, but at any rate. Um, I, I hope there are these hearings because, you know, when, when, when sections of the elites fight each other, that's sometimes when some truth comes out. Otherwise, they, they manage this very well. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised at how well they're managing this issue of the, the, the attempted coup prior to the six, because there's very little discussion. I think I saw one article in Politico where a former national security person, uh, Fiona, and I forget her last name, uh, she wrote an article more, more or less saying what I'm saying, but hardly anywhere. Um, I, I, will there be any real accountability? No, I don't think there will be. I hope there's some process, something will come out of it. But the more important issue is why is there such a rising fascist movement and what can we do about it? Because even if Trump went to jail, frankly, it would turn him into a martyr for this movement. Now, I'm all for Trump going to jail anyway, because I, I think there needs to be accountability. And, and part of that would be him going to jail for all the various things. But we have to have a far deeper analysis of why 74 million people vote for Trump. The, the, and I'm sure I wouldn't call that whole 74 million people part of a fascist movement, but there's at least a third, maybe, maybe more. Uh, and, and, and those 74 million people did vote for someone who is essentially a fascist type of populism. I don't even like calling it populism, but... I'll give you my theory why. I just tell me if I'm a left-wing nut. These are 74 million people living without basic universal health care, education, higher education, retirement, security, uh, parental leave, uh, basic universal services that every wealthy nation uh, seems to be better capable of than this one, uh, which, where you got Democrats who want to means test survival checks. You know, you, everything is partial and divisive and bureaucratic, and they resent it. Uh, and when people are angry and you have a fascist buffoon come along and tell them who to blame, they're happy to blame whoever they're told to blame. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I mean, I agree with all of that. And I, I, I would like to particularly focus on the issue of education and schools. Um, you, you go look at what's being taught as history in the schools. And if you look at, for example, I lived in Brooklyn for a little while and Baltimore. And in both places, my kids, I have eight-year-old twins. If you looked at what they're learning in history and compare it to rural Texas or rural Wyoming or rural anywhere, it's like two different worlds. Uh, my kids went to school with African-American and Latinx kids. Uh, they learned something about the civil rights movement. They learned, I, you know, I wasn't a great history, but when I went to both teachers in both schools, I went and said, I don't want my kids standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I started to explain why. In both schools, the teacher said, I'm with you. I am not going to make them stand up. I think it's terrible they have to do that. I don't think I would have gotten that reaction in schools in, in most of rural America. And the, you know, the... You know, this obviously goes back right into slave society culture, but in modern history, the roots of education and how history is taught is in the Cold War, in McCarthyism, and then Reaganism. And, and it, is, it is such a false consciousness of what America is, and it is all based on blaming the other. You know, you know, whether it's immigrants or, or, you know, whether it's, you know, whoever you want to blame, uh, you can blame this abstraction called government and, and not talk about the way, you know, the elites actually control the government. Um, and it's all part of the construction of the military industrial complex and the mythology that, it, you know, blame, you know, the communists for everything and, and so on. We can get into it more deeply, but if you want to blame anybody a lot of blame has to go on the Democratic Party and, the, and to the extent to which they have so given up on rural America. You know, yeah. all their focus is on 
the, where they win votes, and that's in the big cities. And it's not like they're so great to the poor of the big cities, but at least they pay some attention to the concerns of big cities. And they've let rural America, you know, mm-hmm. descend economically, uh, culturally. And, and, and then why is it any surprise that p- kids that are born into a culture which is anti-scientific, has no sense of, of, of history. Uh, you know, I, I, and it's not, I got to say, it's not just rural America. Even some places, I, I know a, a girl, she went to school and she was asked to write an essay about World War II. And she completely mixed up the Soviet Union and the German SS and made them the same thing and got an A plus on her test. I mean, yeah. teachers themselves barely know the history. So, uh, so the real question is, we're, you know, we can blame the corporate Dems, but they're looking after their interests and Wall Street interests. What are we going to do is the question. How are we going to try to, you know, help people who have been denied any sense, any real history, teaching of real history, and, and some sense of what's really going on today? How do we get to rural America? How do we get to those sections of the working class who, who are, you know, you know, have been sold that science is your enemy. Well, it may be something we need to work on in future shows. I hope you can come back on. But in the next minute and a half that we've got, uh, I think people can tell you've got some great analysis happening at theanalysis.news, and they'll go check it out. But they won't find you on YouTube or via Google. Uh, what's well, no. Deal? Yeah, we're on. We're, well, they t- well, I did the first story where I reported some of what I just said earlier. They took down. And now I had clips of Trump's calling the elections fake. So maybe their algorithm picked that up and they deleted right. the, They took the story right down. So I reposted the story without Trump and they didn't take it down. So it is still there. Of course, it's easier just to come to our site. But I tried to buy an ad to promote it and they banned me for life for, from Google advertising because apparently I've, I, whatever I did was so egregious that it violates their policy. It's crazy. I thought it'd be, it must be another algorithm, but after I appealed, somebody human actually looked at it and confirmed the denial. Without having to justify or explain themselves to you. They're a private company. They can do as they please. <laughs> Paul J, I wish we had more time. Uh, you can find Paul J at theanalysis.news. Uh, where else can people go to, to keep track of No, that's the place. Go to the website. That's the best place, theanalysis.news or .com. Both of them work. Terrific. And if people uh, want to yeah. do anything, yeah, you could go to the YouTube channel and subscribe, email Google, make some noise, but they, I don't think Google gives a shit. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave Google out of it. Go to the analysis.news. Paul J., thank you very, very much for coming on Talk Nation Radio. Thank you, Dave. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.